Okay, let's get specific. Let's talk about living in Peru and Chile. So my experience was I lived in Chile for six months. It was the first country that I went to when I decided I wanted to leave the United States. And I was there for six months, uh, approximately six months. You know, the people were really nice. Um, the country is beautiful, but it didn't work out for many different reasons that I really can't get into. But so it does work out for people and it is a place to consider, it def especially if you like extremes of weather. Now, Chile is really long. You know that if you look on a map, it's actually longer than the United States is wide. But from east to west, it's only about an hour wide in some places. So you go from the coast to the mountains, um, which there's a lot of volcanoes, uh, in in about an hour in less than an hour the water in the ocean is really cold all the way up the coast right up to the north where you would think when you look on the map it looks like it's tropical there and the water should be getting warm it doesn't the water is freezing in the ocean even in the middle of the hot summer um, but there's a lot of nice things about Chile I am not up on all the latest news it's it was like 24 years ago I was there in 1999 1999 and uh but and their spanish is they it's it's odd for being in south america but they speak spanish similar to the way they speak it in the caribbean islands they drop off s's at the end of words and they do some other things too they have their own peculiar accent um but the people are really friendly um it's uh, supposedly has a kind of a good economy for south america um so if you find something good there, especially if you have a connection, if you have a friend, family, I would definitely um, look into that. Um, the, the capital city, Santiago, has a lot of pollution. It has smog. It's similar to Los Angeles in some ways. And they say that Chile is like California turned upside down because you have deserts in the north of Chile and you have a lot of uh, rain and forests and lakes in the south of Chile and you have this main city which has a lot of pollution population and smog uh, so I'm sorry to the Chilenos but I didn't find the food to be very interesting in Chile I was only there for six months I tried a whole bunch of different things it was not very interesting to me it's very cold there in the winter, even though it might not even ever go below zero, but it's so humid. And for some reason, this is what they did back then. In the town, in the towns, they leave all the doors wide open. They put space heaters in the stores. The doors are wide open. You just feel cold all the time for some reason, cold and humid in the winter there. Um, so you need to get advice about Chile from another person, but I am going to talk about Peru now because I lived in Peru two times, the first time for seven years, and then um, I left for a few years, and then I got married, and I went back with my wife and lived there for four years. I, I really like Peru. I love Peru. Now, I lived specifically in a southern city with the name Arequipa. Arequipa, A-R-E-Q-U-I-P-A. I didn't live in the capital. I went to the capital, Lima, uh, which is basically in the center of the country on the coast, on the Pacific coast, on the west coast. I, I, did, I wouldn't want to live in Lima. If I had to, now I'm from New Jersey originally. If I had to put it in American terms, I would say like Lima felt like New Jersey in Spanish. <laughs> Although lots of parts of New Jersey are in Spanish. Um, <laughs> in some of the towns, they speak a lot of Spanish there. But yeah, so Lima was, if you like that, it's very um, like city slash suburban, lots of neighborhoods, malls. Um, yeah, malls, some similar to the malls in the U.S., great big malls. You, you're much better if you have a car to get around uh, in uh, Lima. And it's a big city, lots of people, and just that whole city attitude. Um, that kind of cosmopolitan things are happening. Now, there are advantages. If you live in Lima and you need to get any paperwork done or visa stuff done, 
they're very centralized in the in Latin American countries um, and you have to do everything there in Lima so I would have to travel up to Lima and that's the only reason that I am familiar with Lima I had to go there many times and it was a long trip from Arequipa to Lima um, it got better though because what happened is first we would travel by bus which was a 14-hour bus ride now their buses are really comfortable they're not like the buses in the US you can go you pay like five or ten dollars extra and you get a first-class seat and I mean it is a huge seat you're on the first floor there's like two floors there's only maybe nine seats or 12 seats in the whole area they serve you food there's a TV playing movies and you can definitely and the the seat um kind of reclines back uh more than what it would recline like in a normal bus it reclines back like it depends on the bus but maybe about that much um uh, there's some supposedly some buses where they go 180 180 degrees but not usually from out it to lima They're, those are for the even longer bus rides but um you they're really comfortable but it's a long bus ride and to just forget about that the the plane ride became much more convenient so the flight from Arequipa to Lima was only uh like twenty dollars more expensive and you're there in an hour uh, I think it was 50 minute flight so instead of 14 hours you're there in like 50 minutes less than an hour or let's say an hour and you pay twenty dollars more so we uh, stopped going by bus. We did that like once or twice, and then we're like, ah, that's it's not worth it. Um, so um, uh, there's even cheaper buses too. We were going on the relatively nice bus. So I'm comparing the nicer bus to the um, to the plane. The cheaper buses, like some of the locals would, they would go on buses where you're just sitting. There's no reclining, and you're not in first class. You're in the regular class and you're it's less comfortable and you're a little bit tighter that could be even cheaper like i don't even know how much it would be nowadays but let's say ten dollars for the bus ride um uh one way so uh what else do i want to tell you about peru all right so the people in peru they're very friendly but there is a culture of lying and like cheating always looking to get gain the the system a little bit and so you have to be really careful once you get used to it you're, it's going to sound like i'm trying to talk you out of going to peru so if you're ever interested in going there you'll really want to go uh and actually i do like to to when people say that they're interested in going someplace I've had so many people just go over the top convincing you why you should go. Oh, yeah, especially when they're there. Oh, come, come. Oh, yeah, life is great. Everything's perfect. And it's not true. There's lots of problems. There's lots of difficulties. So I, I, I actually, I do it the other way. I'm going to try to talk you out of it. And if you're still interested, then you, you'll be more prepared for it. You should definitely prepare yourself, educate yourself, know the good and the bad. I loved Peru though. I had a great time. Why would I be there for seven years and then go back for another four? I loved it. Um, the people, but I speak Spanish, so the people I had, you know, fun speaking to the people. They speak pretty good Spanish. Um, they don't sound like people from Chile at all. They have their own particular accent. They speak very clearly, um, and they have pretty good education system there. Uh, not the greatest, but yeah, people are very nice. Um, there are earthquakes and volcanoes in both Peru and Chile. There's a lot of little rumbling here and there. If you check the earthquake map on uh, online, you'll see that they're always getting little three point this, four point that, five point that. I was actually there, and I'm from New Jersey, where we have no earthquakes. There was a huge earthquake the first year that I was there. It was an eight point two. Believe it or not, you might say, "No, you must be making a mistake." It was an eight point two. It shook the house. We were renting a house at the time for a minute and 40 seconds. We definitely all thought, we were all praying, we thought it was the end of the world and couldn't believe that the house didn't collapse on us. But they know that they're gonna have earthquakes so they build the houses. You see them going up, they use all this rebar. It's like a big cage all around the house. The ceiling, the floors, the walls, they just leave the doors and the window spaces. And then they put all the bricks, you know, well, as they're building it, they're putting all this rebar and bricks 
So the house is a big cage of metal. So yeah, it'll shake when there's an earthquake, but everything basically stays together. And the stucco on the outside, that'll crack. And maybe the windows will crack. And that's exactly what happened in the big house. We were in a big, like, three, four story house and nothing broke. No walls collapsed for an, a minute and 40 seconds. And it was a big earthquake. It really shook like crazy. The doorway was moving so much. And um, just uh, like three or four windows cracked that we had to have replaced. And that was it. The owner replaced them. So um, uh, yeah, earthquakes, volcanoes, um, not a lot of active volcanoes, but like they might be smoking and stuff like that. Um, now, border crossing. So if you go to Arequipa, one of the advantages is you're close to the Chile border, the Chilean border. You can, you take a bus down there in the morning and it's inexpensive and you'll be there in about four or five hours. You cross the border and I found this out actually after being there for many years that you could actually just cross the border and then hop on a bus and come right back in. I always was under the impression that you needed to stay overnight. And so we would always stay over, stay the afternoon because you'd be there by like noon or one in uh, Chile, go have lunch, find a hostel, a pension or a place, you know, Airbnb to stay at, not too expensive and stay and go the next morning, go have breakfast or immediately try to get on the bus and uh, go back up to Atiquipa. But then I found out that you could actually do it all in one day if you want to. So you could go down um, in the morning, just go, they won't let you like just do the turn right at the border crossing. You have to leave the border crossing area, go to the bus station, which is just a half an hour away, 20 minutes away into Chile. You just hop on the very next bus to go back to Peru right there at the bus station. You can do it if you want. You know, you just pack a lunch or whatever. Um, you just, and no, they serve lunch right there too. If you can, you know, if you're interested in that while you're waiting for your bus, but the buses are usually leaving pretty regularly, like every 30 minutes to every hour. Um, not very expensive, the same price. You just hop on another bus and it takes you right back to Arequipa. So you can do it all in a day. It's one long, exhausting day. But now I'm under the impression, the way it was even when I was there the last few years, and I don't know if it's changed or gotten better or worse, but you, when you go there, you get a... Um, a tourist visa you don't have to do anything for your visa they just you just arrive at the airport and they stamp it in your passport but when they ask you how long you're gonna be there tell them you wanna be there um, for at least six months and they might look at your flight and so if you don't have a return flight you'll have to see you might not need a return flight um, but there are ways around that oh, let's see if I can explain this so um depending on what the requirements are now, and you should find this out. If you have to have a return flight, if you can't just buy a one-way ticket, because they used to do that, you can buy, and you have to be really careful about this so you don't lose your money, but you can buy two flights, or you can buy a round trip, but um, or you can buy two separate flights. Your return flight to the U.S., because they might require that. They might say, you can't come into Peru without a return flight. Are you just going to live here? You're emigrating? Isn't it funny? They just let people into the U.S. Um, without requiring anything like that. But other countries like Peru, they require you to have a return flight um, or a flight showing that you're going on to another country at least. So what you can do is, you'll have to check this out. I forget which airline it is. I think it's Amer American airline doesn't exist anymore, does it? You have to call up the different airlines, find out which flight is flying from, I think we used to do it with American. You buy, you buy their fully refundable ticket. You don't buy their cheapest ticket. You have to buy the more expensive ticket and make sure, clear this with, with the company first. Ask them if for some reason I decide I'm not gonna use this ticket, can I refund it at any time? over the phone and if they say yes then that's the one to get so you have to clear that make sure that 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 works so you um so you'll re have you, your return flight and you can prove it you can show it on your phone or that you'll have something printed out they say okay you can come into peru but as soon as you get to um peru you call up i mean if this is your plan you might want to keep that flight like you you set the flight for six months out um but it's going to be expensive. You know, it won't be the cheaper flight. 
but you can call up the airline and cancel the flight and make sure you use your debit card so they can refund it to your bank account. That's the way that you can get around that. Um, oops, sorry for... But, you know, otherwise you're just... How can you do it then? How can you do it? You, They're not going to just let you travel to other countries without proof of return unless you have a job, you have a work visa, and you have all those things lined up, which I imagine you're not going to have that. So, um... Uh, that's one way to do that. So when you get to Peru, you can uh, then I think what they'll give you the stamp in your visa, the visa, which is a stamp in your passport. That's all it is. It'll say six months. You have to go online and look up what the maximum is right now. When I was there, it was a maximum of six months, 180 days. The, the, for actually, the first year, maybe it was a full year. Um, I'm not sure if it was a full year or if it was six months. I think it was six months. So after six months, you have to renew that visa. But it might be a full year now, and then it might be six months after that, and then it gets lower and lower each time you stay there um, until you can prove, like, residency, which is harder to get. It depends. If you're older and you're retired, you can use your Social Security as a proof of income, and you have to go through a process to get residency like that. But um, for the time being, you can, I mean, you can go there and live there illegally. I don't recommend doing that. Um, I always had uh, I always had a, a verified visa when I was living in any of these countries. So, um, you know, a valid visa. So let's say it's six months. Um, the the guy at the when you when you travel, they're going to ask you and your, your flight should show that you're going to don't get a flight for one month because then they're not going to give you a visa for six months. They'll give you a, a visa only for one month. And one month is going to go by like that. So what you want to do is you want to get um, find out what the longest it is and then get the visa for that long. So um, they'll put that in your passport then. It will reflect whatever you tell them. You know, Or if they ask you, you say, yeah, what's the longest visa I can get? But your flight should show it. Do some research on that. Um, at least six months. So in six months is going to go by fast too. Then you're going to have to go to the bus station. You ha oh, and do not let the six months be up. And always count it by 30s, 30 days, not 31, whatever. Always be conservative because you never know if there's going to be some kind of bus strike. Don't wait until the last day for your six months to be up. Big mistake. I've seen people do that. And then when you get to the border, they fine you. They take advantage of you. You could have all kinds of trouble. And if you don't speak Ang Spanish, you're really in trouble. They're going to be like, oh, you, come on, you have to pay up $100, $200 to take care of this. They're always looking for In Peru, they're really corrupt. And, um, and you might be, again, why, are you, why did I want to live there? Well, I learned how to avoid the system. In Chile, they're not. In Chile, they're honest. Um, you just go right over the border in Chile, everything's above board and honest. Even the taxis, they all just use a meter and they charge you whatever the standard fee is. In Peru, you have to know where you're going or there, you know, the locals to go from point A to point B might pay three soles, three soles, which is like, I don't know what that is now, maybe a dollar. Um, and, uh, they'll ask you for 10 soles for the same trip. You have to know. You have to ask lo locals. That's why you need to learn some Spanish. You ask the local bef until you know the system. Um, how much would you... Excuse me, sir. And they'll love to talk to you if you're speaking English to them. Most of the people. Just look at them and you can try to figure out how maybe this person speaks English. Or just ask around. Do you speak English? Or maybe they speak a little Spanish. How much would you pay to go from here to you know there? And you name your hotel or your Airbnb or your neighborhood. And they'll tell you, oh, I wouldn't pay more than four soles. Maximum five. They'll, they'll, most people will tell you. And then ask two or three people if you want to get a second opinion. And then when you go to the taxi, you tell the taxi. Um, he'll tell you he'll hear your accent and he's going to say 10 and you say, I'll give you four. When you know how much it's supposed to be, you can say it with confidence. I'll give you this much because you'll know. Most in Arequipa, most of the time, I, I don't know what's going on there now. It's been a few years, but I usually never paid. When I had to travel across the entire city, I might have to pay seven soles and that was like $2. That's how cheap it is to travel by taxi. So most of the time, if I was using a taxi, I was paying less than a dollar. About, yeah, about three or four soles, maybe 250, right around there. So it's probably gone up a little bit with the cost of living, but not much. Um, ask around. So when you, before your, before your visa uh, expires, 
go the first time you're doing it go a full week like you might think no i want to use up as many days of the visa as possible go a full week before the visa is going to run out because you don't know what kind of complications there they have strikes in those countries where all of a sudden the buses all just stop or if there's an earthquake you know it, it happens rarely there's rumblings and tremors but the big earthquakes happen more rarely but you just don't know what's going to happen and so go a week before your visa is going to be up the first time you have to do it go down there you could stay overnight or you could try to come back in the very same day and then you'll have another six months and when you when you're going back ask them can i have another six months please seis meses por favor seis six meses months por favor please um ask for another six months if they'll give it if they say no no sorry maximum three because eventually they might just give you one month and you'll have to deal with that but a lot of them are giving like three months six months and then if you go all right so if you get to the point where you're you're they're just giving you one month and you really want to continue living in peru another thing you can do which is really weird um if you haven't seen your family for a while in the u.s and you decide you didn't plan on doing it but just like happened to me you decide oh i'm going to go back and see my family you go back to the u.s if you can renew your passport uh, make sure you have a new passport when you first go there but you can renew your passport you can renew your passport at any time even if it's new you can renew your passport they might ask why and you say well i feel like the pages are going to fall out or something or whatever reason you feel good with um maybe they won't ask you but i've renewed passports that still had three or four years left on them but i had so many stamps come from going back and forth across the border that they start to say what's going on why are you going back and forth to chile so much um and then they start to give you a hard time now they'll let you go they'll let you go but they'll say i'm just going to give you one month now or two months yeah not one month they'll usually give you then two months but two months goes by so fast you're like oh i gotta go back on that bus back down to chile so when you go back to the states you get a new passport when you get a new passport it's weird we don't keep the same number on our passports in the u.s they give you a brand new passport a brand new number and that costs you about 130 dollars um, as of now in 2024 more or less 100 maybe 150 but it's worth it so you get that you have your new passport you go back down to peru and you're a new person to them they have no record of you in some ways i think in other ways they do have a record of you but when it comes to the visas they're just going to see a blank clean passport you go down and they'll start giving you the maximum time again um and that's one way to do that uh so the other thing is if you are kind of an adventurer and you want to go from chile to peru to colombia colombia is really restrictive that's a harder country with visas and stuff um but Panama and Costa Rica, people go back and forth between those two countries. The only problem with Panama and Costa Rica is to, they require you, when you go over the border, to stay in the other country for three days. You can't just do it overnight. So you have to go and stay somewhere. It's not such a big deal for a lot of people, um, but you have to stay over the border for three days. There's still a lot of corruption on those borders between um, uh, Panama and Costa Rica and also Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Nicaragua is to the north of Costa Rica. You can cross the border there. Um, so, uh, all right, what are some of the other things? Because I wanted to give you some other ideas uh, and some important tips. So the language is Spanish. They have beautiful markets. There's wonderful things there in Peru, um, but there's some bad things. Be careful of taxis. You can use it use a taxi during the day always look at the taxi driver never hop right in never hop in the taxi americans have that i think a lot of westerners have the idea a taxi pulls up taxi they pull over and you hop right in and then you start talking to them never do that do not start talking don't hop in the taxi you go up to the window no matter how many people are around you go up to the window and you talk to them first look in their eyes I never went in a taxi with a young person. Why? They're the ones that mug people. They mug and they kind of like, they'll kidnap you for a short while, just steal all your clothes and leave you in your underwear. I mean, they'll steal everything. They'll steal your glasses, your shoes, your everything you have. If you're a woman, your earrings, your necklace, and they touch you all over, it's, it's really bad. So I hope I scared you a little bit right there. But 
just don't take a taxi at night. That happens almost always at night. I didn't go in taxis with young drivers because most of the time I asked people that were mugged and a lot of them were locals and they always said it was a young guy. Um, always look for the old guy. And if you're patient, just don't be in a rush. Look around. You'll always see some old, little old guy driving a taxi and those are always the best guys. And they're, they most likely are not going to mug you. Um, and then so you talk to them and they'll also give you a good price. Usually if you go with the older guys, it's just hard to find the older guys. Um, and when I say older, I mean like 60 and up. So uh, say, uh, you know, how much is it going to be from there to there? Usually they'll tell you the correct price too, but you need you still need to know the price. You'll learn that stuff um, in the long run. Don't have the attitude, oh, I don't care in dollars, it's only $2. It's cheap for me. Don't ruin it for everyone else and for the locals. And then you're also training them to get used to the Americans overpaying. Imagine if somebody came from Japan to New York or to your town, whatever it is, and the taxi drive from point A to point B should be, or the, the um, Uber drive should be, let's say, $7.00. But the Japanese guy is used to paying way more in his own country. So the Uber guy goes, ah, Japanese guy. All right, that's $21, three times as much. Is that good? Is that fair? Is that right? It's wrong. We know it's wrong. So don't, don't like approve of it. Don't help it by just feeding into that system by overpaying. I saw a lot of Americans do that. Ah, who cares? It's only $2. Back home, you, you couldn't even get in a taxi for $2 or a bus. Learn what the locals pay and pay what the locals pay. Do it the right way. You just have to you have to find it out in the country because they will take advantage of you as much as you will let them take advantage of you. Um, but uh, buses are super cheap in those countries. Now in Peru, they have these things called combis, which is just a van converted into a bus. And they're terrible, but you should get in one at least once. Uh, hopefully you won't catch some kind of disease, but they're just, they pack everybody in this little van. It's like, by all rights, maybe nine people should sit in there and they'll put in like 17 people. And you're just like all on top of each other. And if the guy in the back has to get out, he has to slide through everybody. It's terrible. But do it once. Maybe once. Um, or maybe not. I didn't go on combis anymore for a while. The bigger buses are a little more comfortable. Um, but they're all really cheap. That's the advantage of the combi. If you don't mind... If you're a small person too, for me it was hard. I'm six one, and it was hard to get into a combi because they're kind of low, and you're hitting your head and stuff. Um, but the reg but that kind of transportation and taxis too, for that matter, and trains and buses, even in between cities, they're it's going to seem really inexpensive to you. It's a great way to travel um, and to get around. But you can walk around too. Rent rent is. Um, pretty inexpensive too. In Peru, you can rent an apartment. I don't know what they are up for now, but I was just there back in 2016 when I left and and the rent had gone up from when I first went there. So it's always kind of creeping up, but we were paying for basically like our own house. They called it an apartment, but it was completely independent from everything else, even the building itself. But it was really weird. It was, it was narrow, but it had four floors. Um, and, uh, we were paying like three hundred and forty dollars a month rent, and I thought that was high because I before that I was paying like two hundred dollars for a nice a nicer apartment in a nicer area. Um, you have to find out where the nice areas are. Just before I forget, in Peru, if you go to Arequipa, the nice part of town is called Caima, but there's other areas too. You'll see them when you look around. Ask the people, what's the name of this neighborhood? Um, uh, and um, and just do some more research on that. If you want, I'll tell you more about that. Let me know and I'll, I'll make more specific videos about that. But yeah, so I can only imagine that the rent is up around $500 a month now for, no, maybe between four and 500 a month for a three bedroom apartment. Oh, when you go to look for apartments there, I made the mistake because I was there by myself. So of course I'm looking for a one bedroom apartment. Couldn't find them. And then even the places they showed me were the oddest, weirdest, craziest, stinkiest places I had ever seen. And then like the bathroom was in the kitchen and just weird stuff. Um, then uh, I said, all right, show me two bedroom apartments. I'm looking all around like that. Nothing. 
all right, show me three. I'm one person. Show me three bedroom apartments. It felt ridiculous. But then I started to see the, the nice apartments, you know, just nice enough to live in. Why? Because everything's made for three bedroom apartments there. That's the standard. Um, three bedroom apartments, you might even have two or three. I had an apartment with three bathrooms in it. Three bedrooms, three bathrooms. Uh, it was strange, but it was nice. And I was paying a hundred. <laughs> I was paying one hundred and sixty-five dollars rent for this really nice in a private gated community. This was back in, from two thousand two to two thousand seven. Um, it went up a little bit at the end. I was maybe paying two hundred a month. So that's why I was like, had when I came back four or five years later, I couldn't find anything around that price anymore. It had gone up. But we we're paying three forty for, and I know most of you are thinking, "Oh, that's so cheap! That's great! I pay two thousand dollars a month for rent, or whatever it is." Um, but yeah, so you can find um, better deals. Uh, but you, all right? So yeah, so I'm going to tell you how to do that. Um, you can find work there too. There's like English institutes. They're not going to pay you great. See, that's the problem. Everything's cheap, but the salaries are low too, and that's why if you could find some kind of set something up online before you go, even if it's not that much in the States. Definitely if you're retired and you have a social security check coming in, that's going to be plenty to live on down there. Um, but if you can be earning something somehow online, uh, then you'll be okay down there because the dollars are going to go far for you in Peru. Uh, in Peru, your proximity to beautiful, wonderful cultural places like um, Lake Titicaca, the largest navigable lake, which is right on the border of Peru and Chile, is only a few hours away by bus from Arequipa. It's like four hours away. Oh, that's fantastic to go on. They have these floating islands that you can go and walk right on. Really cool, great experience um, to go there. Um, you can go to Cusco, which is the ancient capital of Peru. Lima is the modern capital. Um, and they have That's where they have all those big blocks and really wonderful tours there uh once you're living in peru do that because then you can find better deals you'll know the system a little bit better if you booked it from the states it'd be still pretty expensive mm, and uh um oh uh, machu picchu you but you do that from cusco cusco and machu picchu are close by uh, kind of you have to take a train to get there but wonderful cultural things and then there's stuff in the north too there's a, all over peru there's places to go there's beach resorts in the north you can go to we went to one all-inclusive beach resort up there for a week it was wonderful way cheaper than um all-inclusive beach re resorts in the caribbean um uh, and very nice, like super quality hotel rooms, pools, all you can eat food and all that kind of stuff. And I think we paid like uh, $150 a day for the both of us. So it's like $75 per person. Um, and that even seemed expensive for Peru, but that's pretty cheap compared to like in, in the Caribbean and stuff like that. Um, but I know you're not going there for vacation. I'm just saying, you know, you might you might be able to do other things. Um, so how would you go if you wanted to go there, you actually wanted to go to Arequipa, for example, I would look for, find an Airbnb to stay at just for one to three months. If you could pay just by month, that would be the best. Uh, and try to find one that's centrally located in one of these nicer neighborhoods. Um, you can look that up online, nicest neighborhoods, uh, in Arequipa. But I'm telling you, one of them is Caima, C-A-Y-M-A. But there's some other ones too. It's not the only one. And so you find an Airbnb there. And then from there, you can go out every day looking for apartment, looking at apartments, even if it takes you three months. We did this ourselves. It takes time. And that way you can compare to see some of the junky ones, the nicer ones, and then hear the prices. Talk to the locals. How much would you pay for a uh, um, how much would a Peruvian pay for a three-bedroom apartment in this area, in that area? You know, it depends where you are. The, when you're closer to all the nicer places, the the malls, the cinemas, and all that stuff, you're going to pay a little more. You have to get a few blocks away to get a good price. But you can still mostly walk everywhere. We walked everywhere. It was wonderful. You didn't need a car. You didn't miss a car. You were out walking. The weather is wonderful. That's why I liked living in Peru. I was wearing shorts and t-shirts all year long. It wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. At night in the winter, which is July and August, right? It's opposite down there. It was cold to cool. Um, I wouldn't go outside with shorts on in the winter at night, but during the day, the sun is so strong, 
you could do that. And then in the summer, the so-called summer, which is January and February, you it barely got up to 80 degrees. It was always in the 70s. It's like so almost all year it's in the 60s or 70s. It's just beautiful, wonderful weather. It's actually sunny so much it's a semi-desert it only rains a little bit in january or february um in their summer it will rain um sometimes so it, you actually start to miss the rain after i was there for so many years you it's so dry and the sky is just blue not a single cloud in the sky every day day after day after day you start to miss the clouds so if you're for i didn't miss them at first at first i was like this is great this is wonderful after a few years i was like oh i wish it would rain i wish it would just get a little bit cloudy you know it's just so sunny all the time and the sun is kind of hot even though the air temperature isn't very hot um uh yeah so you get the airbnb and then you look around and that way you can find a good apartment and not overpay someone's going to tell you oh no there's your friend is that guy's crazy you're not going to find an apartment for 500 dollars or 340 or whatever whatever it really is going for i don't know what it is going for now uh they're going to tell you oh that doesn't exist you're going to have to pay at least 1500 that's the old days that was years ago no talk to people believe me peru's economy has not improved that much it's not america you're going to find something might not be as cheap as I'm thinking, but you should be able to find something. You have to ask around, ask a lot of people, meet people, find the people that speak English. The younger people might know it. How much does, cuánto cuesta un departamento de tres, uh, tres, con tres habitaciones? How much does an apartment with three bedrooms cost? Oh, it depends. They're all gonna say, depende, it depends. Okay, give me a range. Aproximadamente, approximately. How much? More or less. Más o menos. They always say that. Más o menos. More or less. How much does it cost? Get an idea. Ask 20 people if you have to. You're finally going to get, ah, now I know the range. I talked to 20 people. I heard the most outrageous range. Just to throw those out. And I heard really cheap ones. Throw those out. It's somewhere in the middle. And I'm telling you, it's probably around hope between four and six hundred dollars um for a three-bedroom apartment um and it'll be relatively nice but you got to go check everything check the water they won't be happy you do this but check the water check the shower make sure everything's working turn on all the lights it's not it's not typical it's it's typical to go into an apartment and instead of having light fixtures there's just a light bulb in the middle of the ceiling so some places yeah they're like that Always take toilet paper with you when you're in Peru, wherever you go. <laughs> you might not find it. Uh, there's a lot of other things. Uh, th like I said, this is going to have to be a series. There's so much to talk about there. But um, yeah, find a central location. Then you can find your apartment. Um, don't buy, if you do go, don't buy anything bigger than a toaster for the first six months. Big mistake. I made that mistake. I went out and bought a refrigerator with a, oh, we got to have a refrigerator and a washer and a, there's no dryers out of the United States. It's, well... In South America, it's hard to find a dryer. You just hang your clothes up and dry them. Um, you couldn't even buy one, probably. Uh, so, yeah, get used to your clothes being a little bit crispy. You just shake them out. Use some fabric softener. But don't buy anything bigger than a toaster for the first six months. You'll regret it because you don't even know if you're going to stay there. That's what happened to me. I was in Chile for less than six months, and then I had to sell all this stuff. How are you going to sell a refrigerator really fast if you had to? Are you going to leave it there and waste all that money? Don't buy a TV. Don't buy a refrigerator, a washing machine. Find another way to do it. Wash it by hand. Hire a local person to wash, you know, uh, where they might do it. They don't have laundromats the way we do usually. But sometimes if you ask around, um, you might have to do it at hand by hand at first or just ask people. You can Now, in Peru, you can hire a housekeeper really inexpensively to come and do that stuff right in your house. She'll wash your clothes. She'll even cook for you yeah oh you wouldn't believe how cheap it is um just ask them what they want to be paid and in that in this case they'll usually they'll ask lower than you would expect i'm a little embarrassed to tell you but yeah i had a housekeeper she used to come she would come to the house three days a week like monday wednesday friday she would clean and she would even cook and um she would even wash my clothes by hand i didn't have a washing machine and I paid her like $35 a week. But that's what she asked for. It was 30 I asked her, how much do you want to be paid? 
I'll pay you what you want to be paid. She said, she told me in her money, but it was about $35 a week. She did a great job. She was an amazing cook. So it's probably a little bit more than that now, but not much, not much. So yeah, manual labor is really cheap down there. So there's a lot of advantages and this helps you because you, you're trying to make your dollars stretch, especially at first, you know, what you, you need to make your, your money stretch. Maybe you could do that stuff on your own. Don't buy anything bigger than a toaster. Um, it takes two years. I'm going to end with this. It takes two years when you move out of your country to start to feel comfortable in a new country. You're going to feel all the discomfort, the language, the culture, and things are weird for the first two years. It will not feel great. Um, and I hear that, believe it or not, you would think, oh, but when people come to the U.S., I'm sure that doesn't happen. It happens for them, too. Because even though we might have certain conveniences here, it's still not their country at first. It takes a while for you to get used to it. So I hope this helped. Please give me some feedback and let me know um, what else you might want me to talk about and tell you. But I'm going to continue to give you more details about Peru because there's so much to talk about um, in different aspects. And I'll try to focus in on those. So I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great day.